So hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here and thanks for giving uh, time to listen out um, to an idea that we all collectively have. Um, and one of the ideas uh, that uh, I'm going to be talking about today is the idea of the seed lab. And this presentation and this time uh, has really allowed me time to think about the etymology of the word creativity. Um, and if you think about the word creativity, it comes from the Latin word creare, means to create or some or uh, to grow. And quite aptly, I would say it's great to have all of you today uh, so that we can talk about the seed lab further. So if you look at uh, ecology and conservation today, and uh, this is a paper that highlights um, does uh, that highlights the last 14 years um, of publications in leading conservation and ecology journals. Um, and if you can look, if you look at these clouds here, right, uh, there is a change in focal interest as indicated uh, in these clouds over time one in conservation biology and ecology uh, and more so conservation ecology and biology now occupy uh, distinct niches of sorts um, in the next slide you'll see that the same paper machine read the full text of about thirty-two thousand research articles uh, published in 16 ecology journals uh, and conservation biology journals uh, and they created a heat map um, so they created a heat map uh, of the topics covered in these journals, and they showed that conservation and society were important topics that uh, were covered in uh, in the emerging discipline of ecology in the emerging discipline of conservation biology that is rapidly changing. So now, if you look in the next slide, specifically, if uh, a topographic map of the distribution of themes, uh, which is a, a to the right here, it's a two-dimensional topic space of the different topics in ecology and conservation. Uh, you see here at the intersections, right, uh, where the dotted lines are, um, at the intersections, there are themes like habitat fragmentation, climate change, uh, population uh, statistics, review and themes that are, common links, not only to conservation and ecology, but one could argue to uh, people and people in general. So contrary um, to the perception that uh, uh, a lot of us hold that uh, people are not interested in conservation biology and the idea of, conser of, uh, the idea of con conservation, uh, Zuzana Burli Burlivova, in 2018 published a paper in frontiers in ecology and it, um, and the environment where she uh, shows that contrary to the public perception there is public contrary to the perception there is public interest in conservation and in fact it is rising over time across these different uh, thematic groups and this uh, is despite uh, the increasing polar political polarization, the reduced funding, and the deliberate misinformation campaigns uh, that exist in the world today. And in the next graph, as part of the same paper, you can see uh, that the frequency of the of the search word conservation um, is pretty high in a place like India compared. To, compared to other places. So basically, the darker the blue, the higher proportion of internet searches for conservation relative to the total number of internet searches performed in that country between 2004 to 2017. And again, you can see it's pretty high uh, given the intensity of blue um, in India. So what Zuzana and her colleagues argue is that we should try and tap into this growing interest and transformation that is happening, not only in the public, but within our fields uh, to make conservation accessible uh, and engaging in a relatable way. And in this talk, I'm trying to do these two main things. So I will outline as scientists and communicators, the first part of my talk, 
um, what is required to create alliances and work together in the present day. Um, and in the second part of the talk, I would like to highlight what is the action logic of the seed lab based on organized citizenship behaviors. And this also stems from the extensive work um, and learnings that I've had from citizens uh, and people across the board who are who have also mainly been non-scientists and what is the action logic that we can also reflect upon um, in our in our field as practitioners, as filmmakers, as uh, researchers, um, trying to create uh, alliances given the realities of our time. Um, so the first thing um, is in terms of present day alliances and present day uh, realities, I often like to refer to this paper by um, by this anthropologist, where, and the title of the paper is pretty nice, uh, is pretty relevant too. It's called "Why Scientists Succeed, Yet Their Organizations Splinter: A Historical and Social Network Analysis of Political uh, Policy Advocacy and Conservation." Uh, so, what uh, Joe Nisa, uh, what Zone Nisa does, is that uh, she has done a larger ethnographic project where she's conducted a present day social network analysis of scientists. And this also ties back to the, uh, the history of repeated splintering in the ecological society of America. Uh, and she contrasts uh, and she she contrasts that with what exists with respect to how scientists and conservationists and researchers work uh, today. So based on the survey of about 153, I think, attendees of the ICCB Congress, her results show, and this is part of her results in, in this network analysis, her results show that um, affiliations, right, that scientists hold, um, there are about 10 affiliations per respondent in this network, and which also includes ad advocacy-oriented activities. And this is much higher than what has been previously estimated in the literature. So it does. So despite uh, the perception that you might be part of an organization, um, and that is your primary identity, in reality, uh, most of us are also working at sub-organizational levels, or we also think that this organization that I work with only represents a very small part of what I want to do. Um, I want to work in, mul in multiple other spheres. And that's exactly what her work shows. So this also suggests that uh, individual researchers, um, people who are affiliated with organizations are finding ways to informally jump across the science policy uh, gaps at sub-organizational levels, right? So it's also a good reminder of sorts uh, to organizations, institutions, to pay, pay heed to being pluralistic in terms of being generous with your affiliation networks, uh, because the picture of conservation and research today um, is very different from just a single NGO or just a single organization. Um, the other challenge which sort of also exists for all of us is um, the is several personal uh, developmental challenges. So especially in research and conservation, and I've talked about this uh, in an SCCS talk before, um, there is uh, Engelfield in his paper talks about a urgent need to dispense with traditionally thought behaviors, especially with respect to self-interest, ego, and hierarchy um, that exists in our field. Um, so that is one personal and developmental challenge that we need to think about. And we also need to think about environmental leadership, um, not only for research, but also more broadly. Like, so what are the relations, for instance, to uh, ecological and moral issues and give attention, rather than just giving attention to strategic, uh, economic, and technical implications of, of what we do. Um, and this is also um, something that I feel, in terms of some of the thinking that we can cultivate and some of the thinkings that might be applicable to our fields, is 
in the 70s and in the 60s, when a lot of institutions uh, were formed, uh, one could argue that there was a need for, uh, and also when the industrial uh, revolution was in place, one could argue that there was a need for, um, for instance, uh, an elite guiding coalition of committed leaders who had lots of institutional power or were given institutional power by the political forces of that time uh, to force change through a system or force change through an organization. Um, and today we see a lot of those remnants in the institutions uh, that we are part of um, or are associated with. Sometimes we see founder effects or senior scientists in NGOs um, and research institutions behaving in a certain way. Um, we also see that there are lots of top-down institutional structures where there are leaders and followers rather than peers uh, that are working on a one-to-one -one basis. And um, George Oduro and many others in terms of ideas about leadership, they talk about the need to move away in the present times that we live in, to move away from post-heroic industrial era leadership to a more distributed uh, level of leadership. So not only having to move away from the, this uh, level, the different kinds of leaderships, so we're also faced with lots of personal and developmental challenges as um, researchers, as practitioners, as filmmakers. Um, a lot of us have to engage in non-traditional uh, forms of training, uh, one where in the systems we're part of don't allow for that. In many cases, they penalize um, you for um, developing such skills because uh, such skills are not only time sensitive, but they also take away from other work that you need to do. So there is a need for all of us to, for instance, develop facilitation skills, leadership skills, skills in psychology, communication, and arts. Um, also, uh, given the uh, multiple poly crises that we are seeing, uh, there is a need for uh, all of us to also have to take a personal, um, take uh, sort of bring it all together in terms of um, understanding what the personal implications of these are to ourselves. So how do you hold many emotions together while being uh, effort driven? And this paper by Marcus and Kitayama in 1991 on psychological, uh, in Psychological Review, uh, I found this table very, very interesting because I was just thinking about it as uh, somebody engaged in sites, as somebody who loves nature. There are so many feelings that you don't even know that you had a name for, that you're actually dealing with and you're actually trying to uh, name you're actually trying to understand all happening at the same time so um, here there are I, he, uh, they list out uh, uh, 12 different feelings um, and sometimes I think as researchers and conservationists we're holding so many at the same time without uh, whether you're feeling sulky whether you're also feeling a connection with someone who likes the same things as you or level of familiarity uh, you're, you're holding a lot of these things together. Um, you're forming relationships, but you also don't know um, how do I seek counsel? Do I need to seek counsel um, at all? So we also have a lot of personal developmental ch challenges uh, that we face. And so just to summarize the first part um, of the talk, um, what I set out to ask was that as scientists and communicators and practitioners, what is it that is required to create alliances and work together in the present day? Um, so the first point was that I, I think we could all agree that we would, uh, the uh, reluctant scientist uh, is more or less now a myth. Uh, most of us are engaged in some form um, or the other um, in in our work, in our personal beliefs, in the intersection of our personal beliefs and our work. Uh, there is a moral dimension of, of leadership uh, that we have to think about. We have to think about leadership being more distributed. Um, and we also have to work on personal and developmental challenges. And so I come to the second part. 
of my talk, which is what is the action logic of the seed lab based on organized citizenship behaviors. Um, and I think the top part of this got cut out, but if you look at the top part of it, it's, uh, the title says um, that there is a rising tide of decentralized mass, mass movements, right? Um, and the graphic here uh, more or less shows you what these decentralized mass movements look like. And we've seen this in multiple places, whether it's the Hingpat Kai, whether it's Mole, whether it's Italian, a uh, rising tide of decentralized mass movements, which also have relational tipping points uh, with respect to new forms of alliances that have been formed with respect to artists and communicators and multiple other bridges. Um, but if you also look at this graphic at the same time, it's um, full of men that uh, sort of look the same, um, which is not what I want to talk about as decentralized uh, mass movements. So what I would like to envision as decentralized mass movements is, um, and not only mass, not mass movements, but decentralized ways of organizing, whether it is for research and not really for movements, is how do we think about being pluralistic? Um, how do we think about being inclusive? And this art by uh, this uh, boy from 12th Standard, his name was Zidane, uh, who worked with the... Um, an illustrator from um, Bengal, Swanand, is quite illustrative of what I mean as decentralized uh, leadership. And another idea of decentralized leadership, and I just want to uh, arrive at this from multiple ways of looking at the world. So, uh, because talking about the, some of these concepts can also sound a bit nebulous. So one was an idea of, if you look at what Zidane and Swanan produced, is uh, what I find beautiful about the idea of uh, decentralized leadership. Um, the other idea is the idea of Anuband, that uh, Ella Bhatt, the noted Gandhian, uh, talks about, where she says Anuband is a net of mutuality. So we can say that, okay, you know, I want to work on this one aspect, but we're all part of this net of mutual, uh, mutually beneficial communities. Um, so Anuban is also an idea of uh, decentralized leadership that we see. Um, another way of looking at uh, leadership um, is to maybe look at leadership through the eyes of trees and tree mapping. Um, so this book by Manuel Lima, which visualizes branches of knowledge is a very beautiful book among many other things. Um, and the, the book takes you through different ways in which you can uh, just map the world. Um, and I will present some examples later. But the reason I, I would like to use trees is that uh, one is that maybe some abstractions in terms of what you think about the seed, seed lab could have a strong resemblance to trees, a way of, uh, a way of depicting trees um, allows for space, space efficiency. It allows for pictorial strength in terms of the beauty and allows you also to magnify your focus on certain aspects of the tree. So I would take you all through about three, four examples of uh, basically tree mapping and thinking about leadership. So, in the first tree, which is the figurative tree, uh, this is a tree that we're all actually very used to seeing. And this is a tree where if you actually um, had to think about it, you always think, okay, what is the central focus? And that central focus is only fe is feeding the rest of the other branches. But the central focus is what is most important. And in this tree, like for instance, the tree of uh, consanguinity, uh, the way it is depicted and the way it's been used over time, it uh, is used to depict very rigid sort of rules that were necessary uh, or one could argue were necessary for certain parts of um, societal functioning. And this was a tree that covered the explicit conditions of marriage. So who could you marry? Uh, who could you not marry? There would be paths in different paths 
um, of the tree. Um, and so this was a tree that this is a tree that serves to be very rule based. But what I would argue for the seed lab is can we think of um, getting together? Can we think of collaborations uh, that moves away from either from top down or just from one place that um, feeds up to feeds up to other multiple directions? Um, so can we think of trees as icicle trees? So for instance, this is our space, maybe our spaces, wildlife conservation and livelihoods, right? And uh, can we treat, uh, think of icicle trees where there is an agency area, there are different adaptations to this space uh, that are depicted in multiple ways that are grouped by category. Um, can we think of the way um, we come together as sunbursts where um, we radiate outwards and we expand outwards? So this is an example of nature photography and the different kinds of nature photography and the sub branches that come out from those different kinds of uh, nature photographies. Can we think of um, how we come together um, and um, our work as multi-directional trees. So this is a very nice example of a multi-directional tree where there, there are taste buds and your central premise here is greens and salads, right? So what best goes with baby spinach? What best goes with beetroot? What best goes with broccoli? And you have the subclasses there and it expands um, outwards. And that is also how we could think of mo models of organizing. Um, can we think of trees, um, and this is an example that I really like, as interactive? Um, so, for instance, people were asked, when you think of the word make, the visual, uh, when you think of the word make, what do you associate it with? So, um, not only what do you associate it with, but what are a branch of related words that move out from there and you grow out from there? So, you blossom with meanings, you br blossom with uh, relationships. Um, so could that then, does this all lead and can this all lead to, uh, to a possible way to define the seed lab, where the seed lab, um, to borrow from uh, Yuvan uh, work, uh, writings on cooperative pedagogy, where can the seed lab seek to distribute power, knowledge and focus among multiple people, multiple species, um, so that we're able to push our own disciplinary boundaries, re-articulate support across um, institutions and connect and collaborate, right? Um, and while all of this uh, sounds uh, very exciting, and if you had to look at, sorry, whoops. So if you had to look at an optimism gradient on the x-axis where one could argue, okay, maybe we're all tired. Some of us are here. Some of us are saying, okay, things are changing. But some of us also know, and also many, most of us, I would argue, would also think that, hey, you know what, we can do certain levels of things, like we can work together and engage more. And we also start to feel more optimistic. Um, but there's also the reality that, you know, when we think about, uh, great collaborations and we think about large scales about how we're going to change the world, it often leads to a level of fantasy, right? Where there are neither, where you feel optimistic about a certain level of things, but there is no collaborations, no um, work uh, that happens and we all start blaming each other, uh, right? So um, what McAfee and all say, um, in their paper, everyone loves a success story. Optimism inspires con conservation engagement. Um, he, they propose five steps. And I think for, I won't get into the first three steps, but I think the fourth and the fifth step are what are important to what we're thinking. So one, uh, the fourth step is Yes, we're optimistic and say, okay, let's come together and let's work in a particular way. But what is a pathway that is forward that we can use that move, moves us forward? And how is it that we can create um, a community spirit? Um, and one of the ways, um, taking from point uh, step four and step five, 
And one of the ways I feel that we can work and create a, a path forward is figuring out an actionable model, right? Um, so many people argue that, yes, we know uh, there are certain things that need to change, but how do you actually do it? Um, and many people argue the knowing, the way to bridge the knowing to doing gap is to think about um, what is the kind of model of change that you're talking about, right? And the first, uh, so what Lauren Mohammed proposes is that when conservation scientists and policymakers address their findings and recommendations, um, they usually we usually do it as to whom whom they may concern. Uh, recommendations where we say, oh, the, there is some policy that needs to change or this or local communities need to be involved. Yeah. And what they say is that uh, this is, uh, it sounds grand, but it obfuscates from the crucial issues of agency. So who exactly needs to do it? Um, and they call it the hatrological model, which says that it comes from the Greek word of hatros, which means large groups. Um, and large groups indicating that the people of the city are one large group. But when in reality, we are not one, um, we are not one large group. So they argue that basically conservation needs to enter the fray where there are concrete actors. There are structural links, there are power dynamics that shape certain, that we expect shape certain biodiversity outcomes um, and must be investigated further. And many can be of these can be done on a case by case approach by engaging in specific field situations and reflecting in a particular practical manner on what are some approaches that we can use to bridge the conservation knowledge to action uh, gap. So there are four different models that um, Lauren Mermit and colleagues put forth. The first model is something that a lot of us will already be familiar with. The first model is the government could be an actor. Um, so the idea is that the government uh, sets, agenda, sets agendas, prioritizes, decides on prioritizing of conservation um, amongst conservation issues. Uh, policy design rests on the sound knowledge of what the government has and policy evaluation. So that's the government as the operator model. The second model is a lot of you will also be familiar with this is the governance process. And if you look at Eleanor Ostrom's work on governing the commons, um, it's a very influential example of this model where rules between resource managers um, themselves determine uh, how they manage a common pool of resources, right? Um, the third model is what the, is called the Zelic model or the model of conservation uh, where change cannot rest primarily on the government nor on a circle of majority where there is existing power. So um, in this model, uh, the Zelic model, there is a conservation or a public concern that can be defended on its own grounds in the face of all other challenges. Uh, so say if you were interested in um, saving the black neck crane, um, the Zelic model argues that this can be defended on its own ground in the face of all other species also being threatened, right? Um, and uh, the Zelic model also works on saying that, you know, we can't create large scale changes in terms of the government as the operator or um, we can't create large scale changes in terms of um, like disruptions, which is the fourth model that I will come to, but we can work on time sensitive policy um, windows, right? So coming to finally, I'll just wrap up with the last model, which is the stat static model um, where political economic regimes are seen to, uh, be the main source of the problem as they act to perpetuate dysfunctional activities and political and power relations that are seen to be the root cause of biodiversity loss. 
Um, so in this model, uh, one could also argue um, that there are certain political, um, there are certain political uh, re revolutions that are required in terms of how uh, we work that would serve biodiversity well. Um, and in, in many cases, one could argue might, might serve biodiversity the best. Uh, is the stas is the static model um so figuring out the actionable model is that the seed lab thinks about the our our work as not either of these three but the one highlighted in um I, the one uh, highlighted in bold um while not also saying that we don't have other affiliations or we don't work in other ways at an individual capacity or recognize the need for other groups to do so uh, in in these uh, three other ways so if we were to say that the seed lab works on uh, the minority for for change or the zelic model um, it is important that we also understand um, using Laurent Mermot's framework, uh, we understand what are the organizational relations and what are the organizational questions that we also need to ask ourselves. Um, so who are we expecting to act? Um, and at what level are we expecting to act? So maybe we could argue based on the document that we have uh, all sort of co-written and co-produced that we are expecting to act at the site um, and the regional, le uh, regional level. Um, who is expected to leave, uh, to lead? So um, if some of the points that I made were compelling enough, uh, I think decentralized leadership would be one expectation of leadership. Um, who gets to, uh, who should be prioritizing concerns in terms of prioritizing concerns with accountability. Um, so a lot of um, these concerns and a lot of these accountabilities, one could argue should come from the bottom up. So for instance, there are fellows and a lot of, uh, I will come to this in the next slide, a lot of fellows, mud on the boots, practitioners, a lot of uh, people who are embedded in site level work um, know that there are certain questions and a certain uh, level of help that is required in the field. So can we prioritize these concerns um, and help out in these ways? Um, using some of the fellows networks, I think Nii Jamo is here today. She's one of the sanctuary mud on the boots uh, coordinators. Um, who also says that there are mud on the boots fellows who need certain help. And also there are people involved in long-term work at their sites, uh, which throws up questions of alliances needed and throws, throws up questions of work that is needed. So can we prioritize those concerns um, of embedded site work? Um, and finally, can we also ask, what is the place of specialization? Um, and this is not to say that... Uh, there is no place for specialization. There is actually a deep need for specialization to fit into some of these organizational questions. Um, and also a place for um, housework or a place for, you know, gender levels of work that uh, is required among us. And it, today is a good example of Rohit, Anuja, and a, a lot of them coming together to put together this talk for us. So what is that level of embeddedness? Uh, that is required uh, to help us answer some of these dynamic questions. Um, so like what causes biodiversity loss, what actions um, could address biodiversity de degradation. And give, given that a lot of us have a, lo a lot of privilege in terms of our education, in terms of our backgrounds, in terms of uh, our majority status in terms of our gender, what are privileged forms of action that could be, could be envisaged. And coming to um, some of the themes from the field, uh, these are some of the themes from the field that have emerged from one, a Green Hub a reflective workshop that was held in January on 
what were some of the uh, what were some of the site level questions and what was the site level help um, that was required so these are a list of some of the themes that have come from the field and if any of you here would like to help out in any of any of these matters um, for the moment, please do email me and then we can take it forward in terms of just figuring out the housework of where and how we can get to this. So one of the, I'll just go through this one by one. So uh, these are also things that we can discuss between us to figure out, okay, what are larger, what are more themes that we can put forth and find ways where we can work together, involve others to um, help out in these ways. So, for instance, in Karbianglong and in Changlangshu in Nagaland, uh, there are some restoration and monitor. Uh, there, there are some restoration efforts going on, uh, but unfortunately, um, the fellows there need uh, feel that they need a level of hand holding to understand. Okay, how do they um, monitor mortality? How do they monitor some of their success? Um, so they need a level of mentorship and a level of, of handholding in that. Um, there were other other themes that were interesting that came around uh, with respect to elephants. And this is something I think Arjun, Shraddha and Leona uh, will talk about later. And some of the things they were interested in was um, how can we think about recreational elephant chasing in Sonitpur? What is the sort of effective communication we can build around that to think to develop vocabulary develop imagery to develop communication around a recreational elephant chasing um how do we think about uh, mahout training and management of captive captive elephants further um anuja um, and others also thought about how can we get more Assamese researchers for turtle conservation um some of the Singchung Bugun village community reserve staff uh, thought about um, asked for a workshop on uh, if there is a fire in the forest what is it that we can do best who do we contact how do we go about dousing a fire so are there any skills with respect to that um, several doctors from around Pakke uh, felt uh, the need to engage with the forest department and uh, other practitioners to think about uh, if there were snake bites, what should you actually do? Uh, there was, again, this came from the field from certain people like Rimung and others. Um, how do we think about nature education at uh, different sites? Uh, there was also um, a small group and i'm going to talk about that later that talk um that felt that it's important to develop workshop a workshop material on diversity equity and inclusion for mud on the boots fellows uh, for the sanctuary asia program um i have another colleague of mine ram who's an artist who has a dream of um thinking about fantastical creatures of Pakke and he's never because he has a disability he's not able to go into the forest but he wants to put this out to anybody uh, to he wants to put this out as an exhibition or as a book um and that is also work that that is also a theme that has arri uh, arrived from the field um and on this group and if there is if there are any other themes that arrive I know that there will be a long laundry list of things that need to be done um, this would be a great way to put it together on the google doc um, and more importantly how do we also think about uh, what we can do and what we can plug in to some of uh, to fill some of these gaps and so Coming to the last few slides, um, what we have worked on so far is the, many people on this group um, have been part of six major working groups. Um, so there's a communication working group, one of which today has, um, and feel free to, if you're not on any working group, if you'd like to be in part of uh, another working group, if you'd like to fill a space by creating another working group, please feel free to do that. Um, so like the communication working group today uh, has put together this talk for us. Um, it's also planning to get us all together on Slack, form reading circles. 
um, there's another Creative Commons working group um, that is planning to put together a photo competition um, and have uh, Creative Commons classes for the Green Hub Fellows, maybe also end up having a wiki chapter where we can uh, populate um, Wikipedia articles with, with just flora, fauna of Northeast India. So there's a Creative Commons working group that has come together with Josna, uh, Chandan, um, and Jolie uh, leading it. Uh, there's also an educational working group, and I'm sure uh, Nayantara will be working on this, and I'm sure she will also take us through some of her ideas in the next few weeks or next few months. But the idea of the education working group is how can we create digital textbooks? And this was an idea I think Arjun, Tejaswini and some others had. How can we create digital textbooks based on some of the material that fellows have collected from the field? How can we create digital textbooks for fragmentation, for conflict, um, for other relatively difficult topics to understand? Um, what are training manuals? And can we have trainings um, that happen at the level of the site? So um, Sanya, uh, I don't know if Sanya is here today, but Sanya um, has uh, is on behalf of NCF. She is going to be put. She's going to be putting our um, teacher training program um, together, where there will be ten different practitioners that we can select that can be part of a nature education uh, workshop that they can implement at their site. There are also people who have written uh, who are in the process of writing seed grants together. So Rimung. Um, and Manisha are writing a seed grant on um, nature education that they would like to pursue in Labukor um, and other places in as part of the Red Panda range. Um, in terms of the art and design interface, uh, there has been some work on nature interpretation centers in Pake and Eagle Nest, but we never got to um, the nuts and bolts of, you know, creating estimates. So we finally have an estimate if there's any forest department, if there's any community that would like to set up a nature interpretation center, what, how much would it cost and what are the timelines and uh, what is the portfolio that we have from other sites. Um, there is an idea to have a blog um, and again, I would appreciate, all of us would appreciate any um, comments you have on the feasibility of having a blog or not having a blog. So that's the art and design. Um, there's also, I think, uh, Tejaswini and a few others are working on design sprints. So can we have design sprints for artists in like a workshop in SCCS? Uh, to say if you were interested in wildlife conservation, these are a set of resources that you could, or a set of exercises that you could start to engage with. And then finally, we have the elephant working, yeah, uh, sorry, I've missed these two, but we have the elephant working group that is working on a range of things. And I won't talk about this a lot because I know Arjun has volunteered to give a talk sometime. Um, and maybe he could just cover a short bit on what uh, they would like to do, but uh, basically covering uh, captive elephants, recreational chasing, and also using um, some of the Green Hub material on films um, to develop an internship module with Hathi Bundu. Um, and finally here, there's a small diversity, equity, and inclusion working group that um, would like to, like I was saying before, would like to develop a two-day workshop on what would inclusion look like. So while there are these different working groups and um, I'm sure there will be others based on the interests that people have, uh, what I feel is most important is uh, this bit, is what are the values that we stand for and what are the values that hold all of us um, together. So in the Seed Lab document also, I would um, highly encourage all of you and a lot of you have already contributed to writing some bits um, of this values out um, quite explicitly. So I also know that we have done this for the My Mole campaign where um, often sometimes we get trolled. So we have very, very explicit values. So on the day, on the days you get trolled, you're often, you often feel the urge to react so 
one of our values is that we all get eight hours of sleep and we only respond if need be after those eight hours of sleep. So even having explicit values, I think always helps. Um, and then just thinking of such organized citizenship and such organized behavior um, is ob obviously challenging because one has to deal with a wide variety of situations at once. Right. I we also have to integrate different levels of reality with respect to the site, what is important. Um, there are also um, very important long and short term challenges that we need to think about. Um, so if we were to say, uh, yes, let's all work through this model, um, a long and short term challenge would also be unless you have work to show. Um, how do you also raise money? How do you also raise support? Um, how there are often also in, in such frameworks, there is a certain value that non-traditional roles play and housework plays, right? Um, and those values might be equivalent to writing a first author paper, if not more. But how do you compensate for these uh, non-traditional roles that we often have to play? And there are certain risks also. So there's a risk of scattering uh, managerial and organizational efforts. Uh, there's a risk of losing touch with your primary vocation of, uh, of the organization. Um, and there's also a risk uh, that maybe if all of this doesn't work out, you five years later, you might, uh, a scientific institution might not want you. Um, and there is also an extreme rarity um, of alchemists who are able to put all of these um, things together to make things work. Um, and some of the internal and collective ponderings I've also been thinking about is, can coming together be thought about simply? Like, are we able to think about what are the vertical connections that we have? Say, I was part of an organization, um, and I didn't know a different part. And then through the seed lab, I knew somebody. So that is a vertical connection that I have established that can be quantified. Um, there was a person in a site or uh, there's a horizontal level of engagement that I'm doing with fellows or horizontal level of engagement I'm doing with respect to the embeddedness of the community. Has that expanded? Um, are there small halo projects? Like are there lots of very small but cool things that we can do uh, that, you know, uh, give you a halo or make you feel good. Or uh, some people feel like, hey, that's a cool project uh, that we could do in our sites, even though they might not have large scale changes. Um, and is there also an emergence of meaning that can come together uh, in terms of, is there an emergence of meaning, for instance, on what are collaborations versus partnerships? Right, so can our um, can our come together, coming together, be thought about um, in these ways? Um, it's also important to think about what does failure and success look like. So, um, this is an idea that would could very much uh, fail, um, and I'm sure this is not uh, given that there's biodiversity collaborative there that work at much larger scales and with a lot of money, what does failure and success look like in both these uh, situations? Do we not also want to overexpand? Do we want to be self-contained? Uh, so it's important to think about that. Uh, and can we also have beacons that remind ourselves um, that you know we want to create um, spaces, we want to be people that are natural, vibrant, um, and feel like we are doing vital work? Um, and see how we want to uh, use or expand the Zelic model among ourselves. And then finally, if I just had um, all these different seeds and fruits cut out from Pakke, and finally, um, if I just had to think about the idea of the, of the seed lab, um, it would definitely be that of cooperative pedagogy, uh, maybe an emergence, maybe a relational tipping point of, of an idea whose time has come, uh, things that can give you small halos, 
um, where we, the community, and we feel proud of small things that we do, things that help in horizontal, importantly, horizontal expansion um, in terms of connectedness, um, and things that sort of and an idea that makes us feel awake, nimble, um, agile, where there is value in motion and getting things together. There's value in process. Um, and uh, you're not also over committing and you're not also saying, hey, this is something that is going to last forever. This is something that I'm only going to do. But you're always going to keep this out. Have a watch for this on the corner of your eye. And we're always going to try to see, okay, how do we um, get things going? I'm happy to take any questions or, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or any thoughts, ideas. <laughs> 